So welcome. It's Monday, September 28th. We're going to be talking about ANOVA as we're talking about applied business statistics. So we're going to jump right into talking about ANOVA. Uh, often I start with that COVID update, but uh, I'm going to skip that for today and just jump right in because I know you are eager to learn all about what happens when we try to test more than one group, at, or more than two groups at a time, uh, what can go wrong and how we fix this. Because who doesn't want to test more than two groups at a time? What we've learned about so far are t-tests. And I've used that phrase t for two. A t-test always tests two and only two groups. We can test experimental versus control, before and after. So we can do independent samples tests, we can do repeated measures tests. But many times in life, we want to test more than two groups, making comparisons with three or four or even more groups. What do we do then? Well, it would make sense that what we would do is we'd take that t-test that we have just fallen in love with and say, this t-test is so good, we'll just use it anytime we need to compare groups. So let's set up something like this. Let's compare three or more groups. We read an article from the Mayo Clinic that recommends exercising two and a half hours a week with moderate aerobic activity to give an optimal level of exercise and activity in your life. And we think that is something that we could test. So we have one group that is exercising for two and a half hours a week, but we need to compare them to somebody. And so we have a control group, which are people who don't exercise at all. So we want to compare some health outcome of people who exercise two and a half hours a week versus those who don't exercise. But then we think, does exercising more than two and a half hours a week have an additional benefit? So if you exercise, I don't know, five hours a week, would that make you even more healthy? So we could expect that there will be some difference between being a couch potato and getting a recommended amount of exercise. But is there an additional benefit from that minimal recommendation to doing twice as much? We want to test these three groups. How do we do it? Now notice with three groups, we now have three comparisons. With two groups, we only had one comparison. Now think, if we have three groups, we have three comparisons, how many comparisons would we have with four groups? You might think four, but actually you would have six because just think of four. So we have comparison between all four, but we also have those crossways comparisons. So we'd have a total of six. What I want you to see is that anytime you add another group, the number of comparisons increases exponentially. So looking at our three groups, we could do t-tests comparing group A and B. So that's the control group and the exercise two and a half hours a week group. When we do that, we'll set our alpha at 0.05, which means that there is a 5% chance that we may find a statistically significant difference when one actually does not exist. We could make an error because 5% of the time, just by random chance, we could get an extreme mean. We could get a number that is larger than we would typically expect, but it could still happen by chance. It's just like if we have a coin and we flip it 10 times in a row. Is there a chance that we could get 10 heads in a row? It's very unlikely, but it could occur. There's nothing that would prevent that from occurring. So by chance, anytime we have a 0.05 alpha level, it really means five times out of 100, we'll make a mistake. Now, if we only do one test, we have a 5% chance. But what if we do a second test? We compare B and C. That also has a comparison with a 5% alpha level. And if we complete the circle and we compare a and C, we've now done a third test that has an alpha level of 0.05 or five times out of 100 will make a type one error, will be erroneously tell us there's a difference when there's not. 
So you look at those and you might say, well, each test has a 5% chance of being wrong. That means that well, maybe there's like a 15% chance of being wrong, but uh, probability doesn't work like that. In fact, it would actually be higher than just 15%. It would actually be quite a bit higher and that by adding more groups and that number of comparisons increasing exponentially can have a massive effect on our error rate. So let me explain this in a different way that makes, I think, a little more sense. Let me use the analogy of a lottery. I'm going to sell lottery tickets and lucky for you, I'm limiting the number of entrants. So I'm only going to sell 20 lottery tickets. They're $10 a piece, but the winner Whoever gets that winning lottery ticket will win $1,000. So my question for you is, given that lottery setup, what would you do? The correct answer is, I would buy all of the lottery tickets. Because 20 tickets at $10 each, how much are you gonna spend? 200 bucks. But how much could you win? 1,000. And if you own all 20 tickets, you're guaranteed to win. So it's a no-lose proposition. Will you know which of your 20 tickets is the winner? You certainly wouldn't know that ahead of time. But you know that you are going to win. Each ticket has a 5% chance of being the winner. You won't know which one is the winner, but honestly, you won't care. Now, this same logic applies with hypothesis testing. Every test that we do has a 5% chance of being wrong. We can, it, it does not take too many tests for us to get our, our alpha level up to a 0.5 or 0.50, 50-50. What that means is, with all of these tests, it's just a flip of a coin as to whether we've made an error or not. We're pretty sure that there's going to be an error in there somewhere. So this is called probability pyramiding. Multiple t-tests on the same data cause that alpha level to skyrocket. One of them is going to be a mistake. One of them is going to be an error. You won't know which one. It's a mess. So we can't use multiple t-tests. We've got to do something else. And that's where ANOVA comes in. We will use this ANOVA instead. ANOVA is the analysis of variance. Rather than testing the difference between group means, we're going to analyze all of the variance that occurs within our statistical model. Now, this is an extension of something called the general linear model or the GLM-1. The general linear model is the same thing that we use with correlation and regression. ANOVA is part of that. So the, the thing that you learn uh, usually stats two, uh, maybe sometime beyond that, is that no matter what test we're doing, ANOVA, correlation, regression, multiple regression, it's all regression. We're using the same mathematics. In fact, even with a t-test, it's all part of the general linear model. Because the t-test is simplified, we're able to simplify the mathematics, but it's all really part of the same mathematical family. So here's our strategy. Because doing multiple tests at that 0.05 alpha level is going to result in errors, we're going to do just one big test. We're going to test all of the variance in the model. That one big test will be done at an alpha level of 0.05. So what do I mean about analysis of variance and all this variability? So if all of us were to take some kind of test, uh, we could just measure our weights. If everyone were to stand on the scale, would we all weigh the same thing? Some of us, uh, some of us would weigh more, some of us would weigh less. So there will be variability in our weights. There will be variability within, every, within our group. So there's variability with everyone in our classroom. Um, but if I did the same thing on Wednesday, and everyone stepped on the scale, would there be variability within that group on Wednesday as well? Of course. Would there be a difference between our group, our total mean weight on Monday versus the group on Wednesday? So there will be differences between the groups and there'll be differences within 
the group. That is variability. Those differences between the scores, that's variability or variance. So there's variance within, there's variance between, and we will analyze the total amount of variability to see is there reason to believe that one of the groups, Monday group versus the Wednesday group, is different. Now obviously I'm comparing two groups here, which is something you can do with ANOVA. I'm using that just as an example to help it make sense as between versus within. So here's what the logic of an ANOVA comes down to. We have two sources of variance, between and within. Variance between, so our group versus the other group. Variance between groups is due to actual treatment effects. Maybe we could think of the control group, the exercise for two and a half hours group, the exercise for five hours group. So there is variance between those groups. Those, that variability is due to a treatment effect plus the role of chance. But variance within the group is just due to chance. So what explains why our numbers are different? That comes down to, to the randomness. You, know, you showed up today as opposed to Wednesday, that kind of thing. If we have variance between and we divide it by variance within, we have an effect plus chance divided by chance. And the chance cancels out across the numerator denominator and we're just left with the treatment. So what we are looking for is a type of a test that tells us, was there some kind of treatment effect at an alpha level of 0.05? If you have no variability at all, do you see how anytime you divide anything by itself, it just cancels out, like it, it just comes out to one. So we can't have anything less than zero. In this example, anytime we have treatment plus chance divided by chance, we're going to have some kind of measure, but it can't be less than zero. So it's going to be positive, and it's going to tend to stack up around one. Because if, if it's all just chance happening in the world, it's all going to cancel itself out. So we're going to have a lot of numbers around one. So the further you get from one, the more likely we have an actual treatment effect. And so we're using a essentially a one-tailed distribution uh, when we look at this F test. So this is called an F ratio. Ratio is anything divided by something else. In this case, we're dividing variance between by variance within, and that gives us the ratio. And it works out to a distribution that looks something like this. What we can do, you see the shaded area, or the alpha level, the region of rejection, what we can do is just look up where would that fence be established? Where is that cutoff score? What is the boundary for the critical value? We'd look that up in a table, or you could use an Excel spreadsheet, one that I could give you, uh, and we can determine whether or not uh, the F ratio has crossed that fence. Is it in the region of rejection? So what you would want to know is, number one, a one-way ANOVA is a parametric procedure. So we're using sample data. We're going to take what we learned from the sample, apply it back to the population. We're estimating population parameters. So we want to learn from our sample something that applies to the larger world a parametric procedure. And we will start with a one-way ANOVA. There are many types of ANOVA. We'll start with the simplest. A one-way ANOVA will compare three or more groups. Now I'll let you in on a little secret, one that I've hinted at already, which is you can do an ANOVA with just two groups. And you can take the F ratio when you're comparing two groups, take the square root of that F, and that will actually give you the T value. So mathematically, these are all related to one another. So T equals the square root of F. All right. We do an ANOVA in two steps. The first step is what I've been describing about that between and within and all the variability. This is called an omnibus test. That means an overall test. What we are asking of this test is, tell us, is there some kind of treatment effect in here somewhere? Compare all of these groups, in the between and within, and all of that variability. Is there evidence of a treatment effect? So the ANOVA, Omnibus test, is looking for overall differences between groups. 
And because it's doing one test at an alpha of 0 0.05, this works for us. So it keeps it consistent with the other types of testing that we've done. However, because it's testing everything all at once, it doesn't tell us which groups are different. It just tell us, tells us that one group is different from another. So in our example with the exercise, if our ANOVA is statistically significant, it means that not exercising, exercising for one and a half hours a week, exercising for three hours a week, one of those is better. But of course you want to know, well, which one? You know, is, is exercising better than not exercising? Is exercising for three hours better than exercising for an hour and a half? That's what you want to know. And ANOVA won't tell us that. It just tells us that there are differences in there somewhere. So what we need to do is follow up on that. And that's the second step. We're going to follow up a statistically significant ANOVA test with a post hoc test. The word post hoc means after. So we do our post hoc test after we do our ANOVA. What would we do if our ANOVA was not statistically significant? So we do a big overall test. It's not significant. That tells us there are no differences. So would you do a post hoc test if the ANOVA is not significant and there's no differences? Well, there's no differences to find. So we wouldn't do the post hoc with a non-significant ANOVA. The other thing that can happen, and this is so frustrating, I've had this happen with, with students as I was doing uh, consulting. Uh, so I have students you know, bring in projects and I help them with their project and they would get a statistically significant ANOVA but then they would run the post hoc tests and the post hocs were not significant. So they had an overall ANOVA that was significant but just barely and it was really more like a type 1 error, essentially is how we would interpret that. And they had non-significant post hoc. So that can happen as well. So step two is that post hoc test. Post hoc test is necessary when you reject the null hypothesis, statistically significant, and there are three or more groups. The post hoc is not necessary when you only have two groups, because you can just look at the means of those groups and tell which one is higher or lower. So if the, let's say that higher is better, if the exercise group is higher, they were better. But if exercise was a little higher and the, the other, the second exercise group was a little bit higher than that, are those different enough from each other that we can say that five hours a week is better than two and a half hours a week? We can't tell that. That's why we need a post hoc. So when we have this significant ANOVA, we follow it up. We say, tell me where are those differences? And what the post hoc will do is it'll tighten up the criterion to accept a difference as statistically significant. So it will help to control for type 1 errors, errors where we say there is a difference or there's not, by using stricter criteria. What are what our what are our options with a post hoc test? In SPSS, there, there's a variety. In fact, there's 18 different post hoc tests in this one block. Uh, the good news is with JASP, I think there are three post hoc tests. We, we have fewer options, which sometimes is a better thing. What I tend to use the most is the Tukey's Honestly Significant Difference post hoc test. And one thing I like about it, in addition to it works, is that name. It's an honestly significant difference. There are differences in the means of the groups, but are they honestly significantly different? Tukey's test will answer that. Now you see the name, Tukey. It's pronounced Tukey, not Turkey. I've had many students who have said, hey, I gotta do that Turkey follow-up. No, it's a, it's a Tukey's post hoc test. Our textbook tells us, uh, gives us the option for Fisher's LSD test. Uh, and it promotes that one, it uses that one. Uh, which is a, a fine test for the simplified examples that are in the textbooks 
where the sample sizes for each of the groups are the same. So if every group has an equal sample size, the LSD test is, is a great test to use. Now I don't know if the LSD test is as funny as it used to be you know, back in the 80s. We remember all the hippies uh, dropping LSD and going on trips and listening to Pink Floyd and you know, looking at their, their Jimi Hendrix day glow posters and stuff like that. Well, you know, the LSD test, as exciting as that might sound, it's not very trippy at all. It just stands for least significant difference. So that's, that's the thing about statistics. Anything that sounds exciting or fun or sexy, it never is. So when people talk about, uh, I don't know, deviations and standard deviations, it's just the square root of the variance. It's, it's never what you think it is. It's, it's never exciting or fun. And in this case, LSD just means least significant, least significant difference. So what is the least amount of difference that has to occur between the means for it to be significant? The Bonferroni test was used, um, the, the, st the statisticians that I learned from when I was a, when I was a student like you, uh, they had all been trained on Bonferroni. Uh, in, the, in that intervening time, we figured out, or other statisticians have figured out, that Bonferroni uh, is, is described as being too conservative. And what that means is you're more likely to miss an effect that's really there. Now, what a Bonferroni test is, it's very intuitive. Uh, remember I said that when we do multiple tests uh, with, at a 0.05 level, uh, we could increase the, the rate of a type 1 error. So what Bonferroni would say is uh, if we have five tests, instead of doing them at a 0.05 level, let's do our five tests at the 0.01 level, and that's the same as doing uh, the five tests, or doing one test at a 0.05. It keeps our alpha level consistent. But again, with the probability pair bidding, it actually doesn't quite work like that. So Bonferroni, um, it's, it's, it's an old-timey test. I recommend I would do the two keys test or the Chaffe test, probably before I would do the Bonferroni. Uh, although there are people that still use that and still recommend it. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Uh, it's just not a personal preference of mine. Um, other tests, a lot of these start depending upon what is happening with your data. So for instance, in, the, in that bottom row, you see equal variance is not assumed. One of the assumptions checks that we do with t-tests and ANOVA is that homogeneity of variance test, the Levine's test tells us whether the variability in this group is equivalent to the variability in this group, or are they approximately equal. Uh, when that is violated, we have to correct for it somehow. There's a, a way of doing that, both with t-tests and ANOVA, which is called the Welch's t-test, or the Welch's ANOVA. When you do a Welch's ANOVA instead of Fisher's ANOVA, we would follow up not with a Tukey's or a Bonferroni or Chaffe, we would use a games howl post hoc test, because the assumptions have been violated in that ANOVA. Another one that I use is Dunnett. Dunnett tests allow us to compare to a control group. So let's assume that we, we go to get some coffee. It's first thing in the morning, we need some coffee. Uh, we go to our favorite coffee stand. I, I'm not really great with all of the terminology. I know a barista is the person that serves you the coffee. Uh, I also know that they have three sizes of coffee, small, medium, and large, and they don't call them that, they call them other names that don't really correspond to small, medium, and large. Now, you are interested, let's say we have groups of people drinking coffee sizes small, medium, and large, you are interested not in whether medium coffee makes you more alert than a small coffee. We want to compare those three, small, medium, and large, to just control group, no coffee at all. So we're making a comparison of three to one. What the Dunnett test allows us to do very efficiently is to make that level of comparison. So when we're comparing three different treatments to a single control group, we'll use a Dunnett test. So all of this to say that there are many types of uh, post hoc tests. You need to know a handful of them and when to use them. Uh, if you're going to be doing uh, ANOVAs, uh, you need to know what type of follow-up you would do for a particular ANOVA depending upon your data. So th this last category that I want to talk about is uh, what do we call the stuff that we are using in JASP? 
So the first thing you need to know, independent variable, we're going to call that a factor. At some point in the future, we'll talk about factorial analysis and how we use factors. Um, for our coffee example, we have a factor which is called coffee. That's our independent variables, the drinking of coffee. Maybe we could say caffeine. And we have four levels within that factor. So those four levels are control, no coffee, small, medium, and large. We have one factor, overall independent variable, four levels within that factor. The number of levels we will abbreviate as K, and the number of people that participate, the number of subjects, is N. And as I've mentioned already, if there is a difference between the groups, we're going to call that a treatment effect. We'll start with our null and alternative hypothesis. You remember when we did a t-test, our null hypothesis was mu1 equals mu2. Well, with a one-way ANOVA, we're just going to add one more mu. Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3. Meaning that our alternative hypothesis is going to simply be mu1 does not equal mu2, does not equal mu3. Now, if we wanted to, we could make, a, you know, make an alternative hypothesis where mu1 doesn't equal mu2, but mu2 is greater than mu3. We could do that kind of thing. But for the simplicity of learning, we're just going to use this as our setup. Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3, or does not equal. You should assume an alpha of 0.05 for your F test. I'll call it a two-tailed test, although really the F distribution just has the one tail. With a t-test, we had just one degrees of freedom. So what I mean by that is we have to figure out how many degrees of freedom we have in our test, and for a t-test, there's just one number. With an ANOVA, we have two numbers. Because remember, there's variance between and variance within. We have degrees of freedom between and degrees of freedom within. The degrees of freedom between is k minus 1. So what was k? Number of levels. So if we think about uh, our, our control, small, medium, and large, we have four levels, or four groups. So what is your degrees of freedom between? Three. K minus one. Degrees of freedom within is N minus K. So that is the total number of participants and the total number of groups, N minus K. So how many people do we have? There were 20 participants, four groups. So we have five in each group. If our degrees of freedom within is n, which is 20, minus k, which is 4, what is our degrees of freedom within? 16. If you add the degrees of freedom between and the degrees of freedom within, you get the degrees of freedom total, which is also the same as n minus 1. Well, if n is 20, our degrees of freedom total is 19, as is our degrees of freedom within, 16 plus 3. These numbers are all related to one another. Between plus within equals total, all of them adding up to n minus 1. Well, what do we do with those? Once we know our degrees of freedom between and our degrees of freedom within, we go to our F table. Degrees of freedom is across the, let's say, all of the columns. We see that at the header at the top. And then degrees of freedom within is running down the first column. So we would go over to 3, that's our degrees of freedom between, and we would go down to 16, and we'd find the intersection between those two. So with 3 degrees of freedom between and 16 degrees of freedom within, our critical value is a 3.24. So in this case we need an f greater than 3.24 for our ANOVA to be statistically significant, and we will follow up with a post hoc test. Like a t-test, ANOVA has a, an assumption of homogeneity of variance. 
means the variability in the groups is approximately equal. We will test that the same way that we did with the t-test, which is using the Levine's test, and that is one of the assumptions checks. It's real easy. Just click on assumptions checks for homogeneity, and that Levine test will be done for you in JASP. All tests are built on assumptions. Sometimes if the assumptions are violated, it's a big deal, and sometimes not as big a deal. The ANOVA test is robust to violations of the assumption of homogeneity of variance. In other words, if your homogeneity test is, is off, your Levine's test is statistically significant, you can still use the ANOVA. But no test is robust to multiple violations. So another assumption about an ANOVA is that the group sizes are equal. We have an equal number of people drinking small, medium, and large and in the control group. Now, if that is the case, if we have equal sample sizes or equal the, the people in them, each level is the same. If the group sizes are equal and especially even more so if all the groups are larger than 30, then you don't really have to worry about that assumption of homogeneity of variance unless your ANOVA was like at a 0.05, just really close on the line, but it's still going to be a trustworthy test. You will see uh, both in the textbook and in the things we'll be working on this week, uh, you see the thing called an ANOVA summary table. So this is where we take all those pieces, put them all together. So we've talked about degrees of freedom and variance and so forth. And what I want you to see with this table is just where the pieces fit. What we have, and I've labeled them across the top, we have seven columns. The first column where it says between and within, that's the source of the variability. Variability, variance, same thing. So the variance, there's variance between, there's variance within. And then add those together, you get total. So column two then is our degrees of freedom. Remember we had degrees of freedom between, which was three, Degrees of freedom within, which is 16, so the total is 19. The sum of squares is the, is the sum of squares associated with each of our levels, between, within, total. So the sum of squares divided by n, or in our case, the degrees of freedom, is going to give us a number that is much more useful. It's called a mean square. That's column number four. That's your variance. So the mean square is your variance. We have just the two that we're interested in, between and within. Remember, that was our definition for the F ratio, variance between, divided by variance within. So column five, the F, that is variance between divided by variance within. What the F ratio is telling us is that there is 17.619 times more variability between the groups than within the groups. Do you remember what our cutoff score was? It was 3.24. We have an F ratio of 17. H have we gotten past that cutoff score? We exceeded the cutoff score? Yes, we have. And the probability for doing that is in column six. So that's their probability or our significance value. Now the last column that you will see in this table is your effect size which is this, in this case, a partial eta squared of 0.768. And we could use a, uh, some conventions to determine is that small, medium, or large. It's actually the larger effect size. So you'll see this table in the text, in the readings that we're going to do for this week. And now you know a little bit about what these numbers are representing. So it's not just some random set of numbers. They're in there. They're in this order for a specific reason because we can walk through. Uh, if you had just you know, a handful of information, if you had just a few things, uh, maybe two cells. Uh, my, my wife likes to do those Sudoku puzzles where you have just a couple of numbers and then all of the boxes are blank. You could essentially do the same thing with an ANOVA summary table. If we filled in the right number, uh, maybe two things in this table, you could fill in the rest of it knowing something about the, the setup for the test. And I think there's actually an example of that in one of the homework problems. So you can, knowing how this table works, take a limited amount of information and complete that table. Okay. Do you have any questions about ANOVA and what we're doing this week?
I think you will find that this explanation is much clearer and more straightforward because I was reading the text thinking, this is really complicated the way they're describing this. They, they go into a lot of detail with the, the mathematics, um, which I think I like to understand the concept first and then I can go back and appreciate the math. Uh, so I, I'm obviously teaching you very conceptually here. We didn't do much math at all. A little bit of addition and subtraction. And, uh, that, that's what I like to do so you get the sense for what this test is accomplishing. All right. So anything else before we wrap up? Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you guys next week.